We'll just jump straight in with this. I'm gonna be talking about the after action review. And the after action review is a very useful tool. We use it to help us improve the way we do things. There's a metric involved in that. There's a physical process involved in that. We can't simply assume that we're doing better each time. And we can't simply assume that everyone is giving us their suggestions as we go forward. Well, all an after action review is, is to say what was it we intended to do in the first place? What did we actually do? And how did it turn out? Did we get what we were after? Or did we fail to get what we were after? Did we learn something along the way? It can be very structured and formal, or it can be very simple. In an after action review, we do a task, we take a look at our original plan, we take a look at what actually happened, what went wrong or right and why, we look for lessons learned, and then we adapt our plan for next time. So we're gonna do a couple AARs on some kite videos. We're watching them because we're finding lessons learned. Okay, so this all happened fairly quickly as these things tend to do, but I'd like to point out a few things. Number one, he chose a good place to stand and launch his kite as close to the water as possible. Uh, there's a bit of an offshore wind here. As we know, opening your quick release doesn't always kill all of the power in the kite immediately. Here we go again. So if he was going to get pulled, he wouldn't get pulled across the grass or across the ground. He'd be going right into the water. That was a good decision. Number two, as soon as he got over the initial surprise, his reflexes took over. His hand went right to that quick release and opened it without his other hand still holding onto the bar. And number three, once he opened his quick release and he let go of the bar, you can see here his hand went straight to the quick release on his safety leash. That's a very good practice. And number four, it looks like he attached his safety leash properly to the front of his harness and not to the loop on the back of his harness. For some reason, a lot of instructors will attach their student's safety leash to the handle on the back of their harness. This is bad practice. It's, it's only something we do when we're doing handle passes. And the reason is, if you are getting yanked by your safety leash, it's very hard to access it when it's pulling from behind you. How's this guy supposed to open his safety leash? For lessons at least, you want it to look like this. I'm guessing this is a fairly experienced person. He made good decisions. He was ready when things went wrong. And as it turns out, not much harm done really. Okay, so what are the lessons learned? These are good points to incorporate into our own launch procedure to use whenever we launch our kite. Here's an interesting one. And again, it happened pretty fast, so let's watch it again. Okay, let's freeze this moment before the kite goes up and let's take a look at it. These are a few things that jump out at me right away. First of all, it's fairly obvious that the kiter is far too upwind. And you can tell by the way the kite's behaving. There's tension on the lines already. The kite is powered up and trying to drive forward into the ground. The kite, instead of being held at the water's edge, pointed out to sea, it's pointed towards the land. And of course, if you look just downwind of him in his wind window, in his danger zone, in his drop zone, I see maybe three, four people. Uh, there's a kite there. This beach looks big enough that he should be able to find a good place to launch without people or obstacles downwind. This kiter hooked in far too early in the process. He hooked in before he figured out where his wind window was, before he made sure his lines were clear. He just hooked in and then started figuring things out. Hooking in is one of the last things we do in a good launch procedure after we've done all these other checks. Okay, the helper instead of keeping an eye on the kiter and communicating with him, just goes to pick the kite up. In fact, you can see his back is to the kiter. Communication breakdown, it's always the same. 
At the first sign of something like this happening, the kiter and helper have to work together by moving towards each other with the kiter going downwind and the helper going upwind to slacken the lines and take the pressure off. It looks like the helper either got snagged by the line or tried to grab it. Either way, he's down on the ground. The kiter at one point let go of the bar and then grabbed it again to try to steer the kite out. He's on the lucky side and I call this a mild death loop because the kite, instead of doing an actual loop, is just rotating in place. And it's doing this because it's back stalling. I'm guessing it's because the back lines are either wrapped around the tip of the kite or tangled somehow. Again, this is something that should have been checked before hooking in and before moving into launch position. Overall, I think what we can learn from this is make sure you're downwind and you do all your checks before hooking in and moving into your launch position. Also, make sure you're communicating with your helper. There's actually a lot of things going on at the same time here. So if you have a good plan, a good procedure, then use it. This is the procedure we use here. It's what we teach our students. It kind of covers all those little points along the way. It's the same procedure I use when I launch. I still go through all these steps, but because I've done it a thousand times, I can run through them in a few seconds. It's good to get all the steps down first before speeding things up. Remember, accuracy first, speed will follow. I'm going to try not to be too hard on these guys because they might not even be actual instructors who should know better. And to their credit, they picked a wide open space. And the guys that are standing and watching is staying upwind and out of the window. So yeah, there is a pile of crap just downwind of his lines. I'm guessing that's his kite bag. If his kite back stalls when he launches, there's a very good chance the lines will snag on it. With all that space around, all they would really need to do is just move downwind a few feet. I didn't notice this until I watched the video two or three times, and this is why things kind of went wrong here. But you can see the student has the wrong hand on the bar. His left hand is hanging down by his side. So student didn't notice that neither did his helper this guy or this guy or this guy I've seen quite a few students make this mistake in the first part of their lesson before they get comfortable with flying the kite and we'll try to correct it before the kite goes up but the big issue here is the consequences for this kind of mistake at this stage in the lesson should be no more than the student gets yanked forward a few feet instead what we get is a potential broken bone or spinal column injury and this guy's kite never even got that close to his power zone this student was given way too big a kite on way too long a lines for the conditions at hand i've got another video on this channel about what line lengths are good to use in a kite lesson so a few things contributing to this situation students gonna make mistakes that's how they learn it's okay but none of these things would have really mattered if the student was on the right gear without that much power. Oh, shit. I'm going to step out on a limb here and say that it's probably not a good idea to try to jump over rigid structures, sharp things, or people. We're free to put ourselves at risk, but that doesn't extend to putting others at risk. And that's why we say, keep your drop zone clear. This photographer sitting on the dock has been placed at risk by this kiter's decision. He's already miscalculated his jump. The guy in the dock stands a chance of getting a fin to the face at this point. He cuts across the water for his biggest jump yet and vaults headlong into disaster. Now the unpredictable wind decides to return and yanks his limp body off the roof, bashing his skull against the deck below. It's all fun and games until somebody gets hurt. Dimitri suffers a broken rib and a fractured pelvis. Risk management includes taking into account and factoring in the random element. These are things like variations in the wind, chop on the water, possibility of equipment failure, lines breaking, 
sharp a metal or a glass thing in the beach if we're walking up the beach with a kite in the air and the actions of other people which can be unpredictable okay so i know a guy he's got two metal pins in his leg and he says to me matt i had a freak accident on the kite i was standing right at the water's edge with one foot in my kite strap and one foot on the beach and just as i was diving the kite to get out this wave came by and knocked the board out and spin the kite through okay so did the accident happen because there was a wave right there or did the accident happen because you made the decision not to body drag out to a safe place to do it um, another guy i know used to work for me i ended up firing him he used to jump right close to the beach all the time and i kept telling him no don't do that jump a bit further away from the beach and one day he goes flying past this other guy that's standing on the beach just missed him by a meter and the guy he just missed was a kiter big australian guy and he said to me matt i almost went up and punched that guy in the face so later on this the, the, the instructor comes back to me and says oh right at that moment my fin broke and so it wasn't really my fault this guy in the video who piled into the dock later he said oh well the wind just changed when i was jumping you got to draw your own line for that somewhere but your decision hopefully is based on a knowledge of the risks and a choice because you're in charge of managing what's happening i broke my neck cliff diving at the river when i was 26. at the time i thought well it happened because the current from the spring rains pushed some rocks into place under the water that weren't there before uh, how was i supposed to know bad luck shit happens at the emergency room they said to me what are you doing diving at that spot in the first place we have people coming into this hospital from there every summer some of them are dead you're lucky that you're not sitting in the wheelchair for the rest of your life instead of just a couple of years of not being able to move your neck and these are first responders and emergency people who every day see the results of bad decisions for myself what i learned is i'm going to be pretty careful to double check what's underneath the water before i dive and that's where i draw the line for me i don't even know what to say about this one except that hydrofoiling is scary the process of using after action reviews was first developed in a formal sense by the military. But the procedure is widely used and has applications in many areas. So whether you're launching your kite, teaching a lesson, taking out an appendix, drilling a well, making a business presentation, the procedure is like this. Whatever task it is that you're focusing on, hopefully you have a plan of action which you implement with the task. After you're done, you go through the after action review and all the input and the lessons learned and the feedback comes right back up to your new plan of action. Do it again, improve and adapt. And we go through many, many iterations of this again and again. This is how we achieve continuous improvement. And you can do it by yourself. It's even better if you can do it with a few people because then you get a lot more input and observation. We do after action reviews in the school every time someone's kite ends up in the trees or maybe someone has a difficult time or there's something wrong with the equipment or something works especially well we learn from it and get a little better each time so formal aar or no people do improve and learn how to do their tasks better but the cool thing about having a bit of structure to it is that your improvement is much faster more efficient everyone on the team benefits we get good ideas and we actually capture them so that we don't repeat mistakes and we don't lose those improvements that are available to us. And best, all those random elements, the unknown unknowns. There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The unknown unknowns are the ones that come back to bite us. We're not prepared for them because we don't even know they're there. Here's an example. Oh, my student is on the water having a hypoglycemic episode. I didn't realize I had to ask him first about blood sugar issues. I don't know what to do and I'm not prepared. We need to be able to identify the unknown unknowns. 
we can not only catch them better, but we can make a process that allows for them and takes them into consideration. And that's how we can come up with things like a good launch procedure or a detailed lesson plan, and everybody benefits. That's all I got to say.